it seemed as if the night would never end. When my alarm went off at 3.30 in the morning, quite frankly, I was overjoyed. My anxiety had been established by the fact that this was going to be my first day of clinical experience in medical school. I was both elated and I was very, very afraid. My main concern was that everything had to be in place. I wanted to be the perfect projection of a young physician, even though I was six foot four and 350 pounds. Oh, my white shirt was perfectly pressed. My tie, belt, slacks, shoe selection, on point. <laughs> I was ready. I really felt I had arrived. When I went into the hospital at 4.30 in the morning, there was already the bustling of healing activity. And I passed this African-American custodian that had worked for the university for decades. He looked up and saw my white coat. And you could see his chest fill with pride as he said, good morning, doctor, followed by a tip of his cap. I nodded and flashed a big smile in recognition of his salutation, but I knew that I was a rare sight that was the source of the pride he felt. As I got on the wards and I did my preliminary review of patients' charts, I went to join my other fellow medical students in the nursing statement station to wait on our resident to make rounds. An interesting feature of this group was that I was the only one with genetically placed pigment in my skin. Oh, but make no mistake. We were all joined on common ground of wanting to be healers. As we went into the first patient's room, who happened to be white, the peacefulness of the morning was assassinated by the shrills of a frightened and hysterical individual shouting, get that big black nigger out of here. Ladies and gentlemen, just like Frederick Douglass did in 1852 about slavery, I come here today to tell you something about being fat and black in America. Coming up in the Mississippi Delta doing Jim Crow, yes, that's right, I'm that old. I'm 67 years of age. I have known the heavy hand of the humiliation of racism. But in spite of this, I believe in this country. And I believe that the American dream was for me, too. I did this even though I witnessed firsthand my parents walking through a gauntlet of KKK members just to secure the white right to vote. I felt this way even though I had been educated from a little boy not to look a white woman or a white girl in the eye, lest I wind up like Emmett Till. I believe this even though if I wanted a milkshake at the Rexall drugstore, I had to go to the back door. I have been called to the bank in Moorhead, Mississippi, by the bank president to be told that he could not guarantee my safety if I went to a University of Mississippi alumni meeting because it was in an all-white country club. Yes, my friends. I have felt the bounding pulse of racism in ways too numerous to count. But today, as I stand here, 
I'm here to warn you about a more powerful, more startling, more broadly impacting menace, weight stigma, fat shaming, size discrimination, and bias. Now, obesity has dominated the airways and the headlines. Six out of 10 Americans in this country right now are either overweight or obese. Six out of 10. Now, I could talk about many aspects of obesity, but I choose to talk about the previously mentioned topic because it's little known. And I do this because we have to have an alarm to go off, an alarm of awareness that this exists. There are those who looked at me at 460 pounds, and they judged me to be inferior and a target to be ridiculed because of my excess girt. The rationale for weight stigma, fat shaming, size discrimination, and bias is built on the premise that I am a defective individual, unsanitary, unhealthy, unattractive, stupid, lazy, and lacking self-control. You know I'm telling the truth. But I want you to ask yourself these questions today. Would you have the same posture for a diabetic that you saw go into a dialysis center? Would you have the same attitude towards a person with chronic lung disease shackled with an oxygen container? Would you have the same temperament for a person that lost their hair to chemotherapy while battling cancer? And finally, would you have the same bias for someone in rehab battling a drug addiction. If you are still pondering the answers to these questions, I will answer for you. Absolutely not. Because each and every one of those examples that I showed you today were people who were challenged with medical disease. And it automatically generated a sense of compassion for their plight. Well, guess what, my friends? Obesity is not a choice. Obesity is not a character flaw. Obesity is also a medical disease. Huh. As I look around this venue today, I see that we still have skeptics as to whether or not this issue actually exists. Well, just recently, a breakthrough new drug was released that could safely and reliably be used to treat obesity. And guess what? The insurance companies declined to pay for it. Now, they would pay for the same drug in a lower dose to treat diabetes, but they will not pay for it to be used for obesity because for obesity, well, it's only a vanity intervention. A vanity intervention. Now that I have greater... I have injected you with greater awareness. The question of the hour should be, where do we go from here? And I would like to offer these takeaways. Be aware of your own prejudices. Let's start there. Two, educate yourself about the issue at hand. Educate yourself. Always try to be a healing 
presence. Expose your children and others to other cultures, other people, so they can understand that the world does not revolve around them. And finally, speak up when you hear something hurtful. Be bold enough to listen to your heart and speak up. Now, these countermeasures share common ground for both groups of challenges because, my friends, racism, weight stigma, fat shaming, and size discrimination and bias are members of the same family. Now, to continue, I would like to introduce to you the importance of language. I believe language is the best place to start if you are to induce change. And I would like to start with racism first. And in particular, the negative implications of verbal microaggressions. You probably are familiar. Let's go over some of the more common ones. Uh, son, you are credit to your race. You know, Butch, when I look at you, I don't see color. Well, I guess they must be blind. <laughs> and, and this is the most infamous one. Butch, I can't be a racist. I have three friends. Now, I hope that in, at this point in our history, we would know that these statements are not statements that should be said. Now let's look at waste stigma, fat shaming, size discrimination, and bias. And let's take my topic, fat and black in America. And let's concentrate on the word fat. Now, I did not choose this term to condone its application. Oh, my friends, to the contrary. In my opinion, I wanted to introduce the word world to this interesting posture that fat is the new four letter word. And in fact, I'll take it even farther. I believe that it's synonymous to the N word. I really do. And other associated terms like obesity, oh no, obese rather, and and also uh, morbid obesity, and even seemingly innocent terms like chevy should be equally condemned. It, the data shows, and the data from people right here at Harvard, my friend Fatima, people of size would prefer to be referred to as having excess weight or unhealthy weight. In addition, we should try to use more first-person language when referring to people of size. For instance, Tom struggles with obesity. And the reason we should do this is because the data also reflects that when you misuse or do not use language appropriately, it can promote stigma. It can decrease motivation of that person you're talking to to lose weight and even dissuade them from having future medical appointments. Remember, my friends, your mouth can be a lethal weapon. In spite of the horrors of racism that exist today, in spite of a long and protracted journey to change, I stand here before you with a smile on my face and in my heart. And my demeanor is dictated by hope. And the words of a great American, the audacity of hope. 
And if we are going to move forward in the future, we must proceed with the arrogance of hope. Now, this is no thread that I'm desperately trying to hold on to. Oh, no. Because I have lived long enough to be not wanted as one of the first black pre-med students at the University of Mississippi to being inducted into his Hall of Fame in front of 70,000 people. And the vast majority, my friends, were white. Do not tell me that I do not have reason to incubate change. Ultimately, my belief in success is bred by my faith in America and its people. That means my hope is centered on you, pretty lady, on you, you handsome sweetheart of a gentleman, <laughs> and you, my brother. The flame of reform has been united, and it shall never be extinguished. And just like Frederick Douglass in 1852, as he ended one of his most famous speeches, my fellow Americans, I want to leave you with an upbeat message. Because in spite of my presentation's early negative societal outlook, I want to leave you where my heart really began, with the arrogance of hope for our future. Thank you for tolerating me today. <laughs>